listening to Affect Autism, where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. If you're a caregiver looking to implement your own floor time approach, please check the ICDL parent website at the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning for a free virtual floor time consultation or for the weekly parent support meetings. We aim to help you implement your program at home using the Developmental Individual Differences Relationship-Based Model, or DIR, taking into account your child's developmental level, their individual differences, and using your relationship with them to help promote and support their development. Welcome. This week, I am thrilled to present Dr. Stephen Porges, who is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, where he's the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. He is also the Professor of Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina and Professor Emeritus at both the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Maryland. He's published more than 300 peer-reviewed papers across several disciplines, and in 1994, he proposed the polyvagal theory, which listeners may have heard of. It is a theory that links the evolution of the mammalian autonomic nervous system to social behavior and emphasizes why physiological state is implicated in the expression of behavioral outbursts and mental illness. And he is the creator of a music-based intervention, the Safe and Sound Protocol, which currently is used by more than 1,400 therapists to improve spontaneous social engagement, to reduce hearing sensitivities, and to improve language processing, state regulation, and spontaneous social engagement. Welcome, Dr. Porges. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And just for the listeners, um, let's give some context how we met. Uh, we met in March, right before the shutdown at ICDL's conference, the Rebecca School Conference in New York City. Well, it was a wonderful meeting. It was tremendous energy in the room and lots of you know, passionate people wanting to enhance and improve the lives of individuals on spectrum and their families. And it really was one of those capstone experiences of uh, going in and touching the world again. And it was really lovely, but it was the last day when the world was somewhat normal. And after that, it was uh, quarantine time. And what I was telling uh, Daria before we went on live was uh, I would be giving people, shaking their hands and giving them hugs. And I said to people, I said, I'll do that. I'll, I'll give you a hug this this month, but maybe not next month. But what I hadn't really understood was that we were already at the, in the epicenter of the pandemic at that moment. And, it, and I also mentioned I went out to dinner that Saturday night and three of the eight people that were at the dinner table had COVID by Monday. Wow. <laughs> it really is amazing to think. Um, I remember having doubts about going to the conference because of COVID and I was so happy that I did because it was a wonderful weekend and you had a, a wonderful keynote presentation and then the world changed. Well, it changed and it's changing us because it's really laying bare what it is to be a human and humans need to uh, co-regulate. They need to interact with each other. And we're interacting through video chatting, video conferencing, but part of our bodies want to go out there and give others the hug. We want to be in proximity. That's right. And, you know, I, I want to get into the discussion around polyvagal theory and COVID towards the end. But what really resonated with me so much at your keynote was this whole polyvagal theory and the neural regulation and, and how it relates to our kids. And of course, I'm always thinking about my son, who's 11 and has the diagnosis. And I just wanted to read a quick little excerpt from a paper of yours. And I'm going to share my screen to show the audience that are watching on YouTube. The brain-body connection may ease autistic people's social problems. And this was a paper that was in Spectrum News in August of 2019. So I'm just going to give a little excerpt from that. And I will put the link to everything we discussed today at affectautism.com under the podcast and in the blog associated with this. Uh, the neural regulation of our bodily organs influences our emotional responses and our behavior towards others and our environment. Many people with autism have difficulty regulating their behavior and emotions. 
Their initial reaction to threat is often anger, irritability, or aggression that may be expressed as an uncontrollable tantrum. These responses constitute a fight or flight reaction that can be difficult to manage. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what polyvagal theory is and how that relates to our children on the spectrum. Okay, when we start talking about individuals on the spectrum, we're really talking about individuals who have difficulty in regulating their bodily state. And this is really what the theme of that article is about. It's saying, what is it that families of autistic individuals want? What's the major problem with autism? Um, it's really that the child has difficulty regulating state. And that with typically developing individuals, the major way that we regulate state is through social interaction, through those facial expressions, through those gestures. And they become a reciprocal way. So when a parent smiles and uses a prosodic voice with a lot of intonation and a gesture, then the child calms down and looks at the parent. But when you have a child on spectrum, there's no, in a sense, guarantee that the child will rotate and turn towards you, smile, and reciprocate in, with those same types of gestures. So often, this is in the family unit, uh, more likely the father than the, than the mother, the father will feel uh, disengaged from the, from the child. The mothers, of course, their voices are, can be very prosodic, can still, in a sense, calm their kids. Fathers, uh, when the kid doesn't look at them, they get irritated. It's an irritability reaction. And so our bodies, in a sense, are continuously requesting a reciprocal interaction. And that reciprocal interaction is a function of the physiological state of the individual. We get confused within the treatment of autism over let's say five decades or maybe six decades now, to start treating it as a behavioral phenomenon that can be manipulated through reinforcement. So if you're not social, you make people social by looking at the eyes. Well, they may look at the eyes, but they're not looking at the eyes in that spontaneous way. And the child who is doing this is in a state of terror because their physiology is uncomfortable in looking at eyes. Now, there's a evolutionary reason for that, and it has to do with uh, being primates, of which humans are. And that is direct eye gaze is a threat response unless you're welcoming. And, you know, people who live in New York, if you want a seat on the subway, how do you get it? You go up to a person and you just look right at them and they'll get up and move. Because it's a, you have to welcome a person to look directly in the eye. It's not a, a person walking on the street staring at your eyes it's going to make you feel uncomfortable. So our bodies respond to this intrusion. And if your physiology is the state of mobilization, that's the word I would use, but you can say that you're really primed to go into fight or flight states, then any type of intrusion, like even direct eye contact, will result in a destabilization of behavior. And so the real issue when we start dealing with children on spectrum is what is their physiological state at the moment that you are interacting with them? And can you find the portal to calm that physiology down, to move it out of a physiological state that is primed to be reactive to threat, meaning going into fight or flight, which is frequently you know, the, the meltdowns, the tantrums, the frustration, because the physiology is really primed to do that. So we need to reconceptualize the experience of the child or the adult even on spectrum and that is to say their bodies are primed to be defensive. They're doing what a defensive uh, a strategy would be. It's not that they're doing anything wrong. It's just they're doing something that's inconvenient to us. And we now have to find that way into their nervous system to give them the cues so that they can give up those defenses and be, in a sense, accessible and welcoming to others. Yeah, and, and that really reminds me of the 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 piece in your keynote talk where you talked about safety and the quest for safety and you mm -hmm. said that it's not a removal of threat yeah uh, we have a, a misunderstanding of safety so i guess the metaphor is that we would put metal detectors in schools and have police in schools and then the schools will be safe well we may be removing the possibility of certain threats 
but our nervous system is far more sophisticated. Our nervous system is looking for cues of safety. And you can think about, you have a toddler who's crying and which means that their body is in a state of potential threat. And how does the effective, good enough mother calm that baby? Well, she looks at the baby, she smiles, she gestures. And more than that, she uses vocal intonation. She uses her voice to reassure the child that everything's okay. I, I used, you know, I tr used to travel a lot before this whole pandemic. And I used to kind of have this uh, experiment, real life experiment I would observe in airports. And that would be toddlers with their mothers and with their fathers. And the interesting sequence was when you have a, a little boy toddler and the father takes him to the bathroom and brings him back screaming to the mother. And all the mother does is kind of like look, smile and say, how are you? And the baby stops crying. And of course the father is just frustrated and mobilized because of lack of control. And so there's a lot of things we need to learn about uh, giving signals to our nervous system. Now I'm gonna give you a vote for the fathers who do very well with their dogs because they will use prosodic voices with their pets. It's more easy for them to do that than with their children or their spouses. And then the pets or the dog will get on their back and show their ventral side and just be uh, tails wagging. So the point is, it's not that they don't have the skill set. It's that our culture tends to rely on the father as the discipline or the boundary maker. And we need to kind of back off of that. And, you know, I, I am a father also. My kids survived me and I learned through their transitions. And I thought it was my responsibility to keep them safe, meaning make sure no harm comes to them. But the real responsibility is to communicate to them that they are safe in our presence. Yeah, and it, it really is what the DIR floor time that we talk about on this uh, podcast, the DIR model's first capacity is all about self-regulation and feeling safe. And I know that you mentioned you were friends with Dr. Greenspan, and I wondered if you could talk about some of the conversations you guys had briefly um, that, you know, years ago. Yeah, well, it's quite a few years ago, and it was actually before DIR actually became conceptualized. And we used to spend, uh, let's say we used to have lunch at least once a week and play basketball also about once a week. So we spent a lot of time talking. And the principles of DIR really come from this notion of contingency and reciprocity uh, and expectancy. So they're almost embedded in them are a type of, uh, let's say, neural exercising. So within polyvagal theory, I call these neural exercises where our nervous system starts developing expectancies, but it's quite consistent with DIR. But what Stanley had, he had a really important insight and that was get on the floor. And was, you know, and what he was really saying metaphorically is don't intimidate the child. And this is the issue about threat and safety. And the other insightful one was follow the child's lead. Uh, again, which was allow the control or the uh, locus of control to reside in the child and then to support the child. So you start having this idea of literally the words change over decades with different disciplines, but functionally you're witnessing the child and you're empowering the child's behavior. So as you do that, the child becomes more expressive and then you kind of shape the behavior. So our discussions had a lot to do with how do you get the systems open, accessible, and in a sense developing a language. And you know, Stanley had some really good insights into dealing with a difficult disorder at the time he started the work because people basically were saying that this is a lifelong disorder. If you got better, then you didn't really have autism. It's a faulty diagnosis. And it's genetic, even though they didn't know what the genes were. And basically they're creating a destiny model without the knowledge. And when they did have all the documentation, they would say in the, in the scientific world, is we haven't found the genes yet, but we will. So it was a preconceived model of it. And so the stand was with, in a sense, building more flexibility into the conceptualization. Polyvagal theory, takes a step in the same direction and says, 
many of the features that you use to diagnose uh, autism are really emergent properties of the physiological state that the child is in. Now, if you accept that, then you can, sh if you can shift the physiological state, then different emergent properties come out, meaning social behavior becomes spontaneous. And that shifts the model of how you would then treat the child from trying to behaviorally modify social behavior, like look in my eyes or ABA type models to say, forget all that. Let's see if we can get the child to feel safe and comfortable. And then if the child feels safe and comfortable, do they spontaneously look at me? Do they have curiosity? And then do they start forming a co-regulator with me? And this becomes this real issue and kind of like a redefining of the broad concept of being a self-regulator. Because I think this notion of self-regulation needs to be embedded in its parent, which is co-regulation. And that when a child in a sense goes into a tantrum or goes, gets frustrated and we get upset and say they're not self-regulating sufficiently, we're, we're blaming them for not having enough control. When in reality, the flexibility to be able to self-regulate really emerges from the historical experiences of effectively co-regulating. So in terms like with floor time or effective parenting, you're always in this contingent dyadic interaction and that provides the resource that enables the child to be more independent, more exploratory and more self-regulatory. Yeah, and I love the way you said effective parenting because it seems that some of the treatments out there are really pushed onto parents and and you almost feel so many parents that get this new diagnosis almost feel like they have to go against their instincts. Yeah, well, this again goes back to uh, uh, many discussions I had with with Stan, and that was you know uh, this desire uh, that people who are working with autism want to fix the disorder, and in in trying to fix it, they put pressure on the family unit. And they take away the resource that is there by creating uh, an expectancy or let's say a responsibility. And so that actually was very interesting dialogues. I used to tell him that if he created a, what I would call a navigator or someone to, to uh, in a sense, uh, shepherd or navigate the family unit into the treatments and not have the mother uh, in a sense involved in it or so demanded, that this would kind of create a relaxation and that there'd be a much more uh, progress would occur. And he had a great concern that if he didn't keep, in a sense, some pressure on the family unit, they would not be compliant in the treatment model. And I think over the years, DAR has, in a sense, uh, become more flexible, more understanding of that family unit and leveraged, how that, leveraged that in the uh, trajectory of supporting both the child and the child within the family. Yeah, I really like how um, the model talks about family as a floor time approach now where you're looking at the sensory profile and individual differences of each child and the parent as well because Dr. Greenspan talked about how um, one can exacerbate the other and yeah. really finding yeah. that match and it, it really is a lot to do with the physiology that, yeah. that Polly Vagel explains. So I, I would say that uh, the sensory part is critical here, but the sensory part is really part of the optimistic story. So that what's happened with the diagnostic criteria is that people start to believe <clears throat> that the sensory features are a, a biologically or genetically determined component of autism. When many of those sensory features are really a function of the physiological state that the child is in meaning that the hypersensitivity to sounds, the hypersensitivity to, to light, uh, the irritability in terms of ingestive food where people, uh, children are uncomfortable with novelty of food, the gut problems. Many of these features are really ex uh, emergent properties of a body being in a state of defense. So if you can think of it that way and say, well, they're literally piggybacked on a physiological state 
And the body has that physiological state. We don't know where it came from, but that's irrelevant. It's in that physiological state. Can we provide cues to retune that autonomic nervous system to make the individual, enable the child, let's use the term not make, but enable the child to spontaneously start to engage, to be able to hear human voice in background sounds, and to be exploratory in this world. Because if your body's in a state of defense, all these, many of the features, not all, many of the features of autism become exacerbated. So you don't have exploration, you don't have spontaneous engagement, you have auditory hypersensitivity and, and visual hypersensitivities. So if you can get the body into a calmer state, then what happens? Well, the auditory hypersensitivities drop out or dampen greatly. Light sensitivity drops out. Uh, many of the gut problems start to drop out. It doesn't mean that it normalizes the child, but what it means is that the sensory components now are no longer uh, a disability. And it means that life goes on, goes on in a more pro-social, more interactive way. And that's where polyvagal theory interacts with the world of autism. But what polyvagal theory also says is many of these sensory features are there in other mental health disorders and other physical health disorders. Because when the body shifts into states of defense, this is the package. You get this because the body is in a state of threat. And when the body's in a state of threat, you can just go to the checklist. It's going to be there. And what you're going to see is not only the behaviors, but then what medicine calls comorbidities. You'll start seeing gut problems, uh, a variety of other issues. And then you'll be running to specialists when it's all part of the body in a chronic state of threat. So the, the treatment model is, can we move this into this um, calmer state? I just pulled up a slide you shared at the yeah. conference because this is what you're talking about. And, and this really jumped out at me too. The, um, what is SNS, something nervous system? It's sympathetic nervous system. Okay, sympathetic it's what we system. think of the part of our autonomic nervous system that prepares us for fight flight behaviors. But we see this as hyper arousal. So within the autism world, hyper arousal, hyper vigilance. But so if you saw like even with ADD, where a child can't sit still, but it's clearly looking behind them, that's, they're hypervigilant. Their body is tuned for predator coming into it. And if you look at autistic kids, they're often, even the posture of what they're doing, bringing their hands up like this and protecting their ventral side. So bringing the arms, they're not doing this. They're not saying, wow, I'm accessible to you. Come give me a hug. They'll say, I'll give you a hug but my body is in great fear, but I'll do that because I know it's important to you. To me, I don't want, that. I don't want to be near a hug. Uh, and you'll start seeing that as children become more comfortable, the way they give hugs changes, the bodies start to conform, meaning that they're safe in proximity of another. So you start seeing these features of social withdrawal. Social withdrawal is an adaptive behavior. If you're in a state of threat, you don't socialize, you pull back. You protect yourself. These are all adaptive behaviors. And if we take that line, uh, you see the clinical features, hyperacusis is sound sensitivities, hypertension is blood pressure regulation issues, gut problems, is, you know, people talk about an autism, autistic gut. Well, in the world of trauma, which is the other part of where I do a lot of my work, people talk about a trauma gut because people who have experienced trauma also have autonomic state destabilizations. Their body is in a state of threat. And you often will see some type of overlap. So some of the children who start manifesting autistic symptoms have had a medical complication early in life. And what has happened is their body has got into a state of threat. And so many of the features that enable that child to get a diagnosis of autism are the emergent properties of that sensory system doing its job, protecting the child from a world, but the physiology of that child says you're under threat. Yeah, and I, I think it's so, you highlighted a lot and I wanna highlight it again. These behaviors are adaptive and mm -hmm. this is the child protecting themselves. And you mentioned hugs. My son always, for years, when someone goes to hug him, he turns around backwards 
and lets them hug him. And then he goes away. <laughs> well, yeah, what I would say is a very smart kid. So <laughs> what, what he's demonstrating is that the ventral side is the vulnerable side, but the dorsal or backside, it's like a turtle shell. He's protected. Go ahead, hug me from behind. You're not going to hurt me, but I'm not letting you into my ventral side. My ventral side is where I get hurt. And when I mentioned about a dog and the dog's going on their back, mm -hmm. uh, people used to say, oh, the dog's being submissive. Yes, but the dog is being trusting. Mm -hmm. And what your son is saying in his body language, he's saying, I know you want to give me a hug, but my body says I'm vulnerable if you do on my ventral side. So here's my compromise. Take it or leave it. <laughs> ah. right. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And it's funny because he started a summer camp and he loves it and, and it's, you know, they're doing floor time and, and I get these wonderful reports at the end of the day. But each morning after being home for three months and having fun, mm -hmm. playing video games with dad, he's very hesitant to go in and he rushes and gives me a full hug oh. and clings to me. And I'm using, and this is a good bridge to what I wanted to get into next um, about affect. And, and that's why my site is called Affect Autism, about all of the affect that you said, the co-regulating. So instead of rushing him into school, okay, yes, yes, go, you have to go now. You know, I'm like, oh, you're not ready yet. <gasps> okay, come and give me a hug. Yeah, you'll feel brave in a few minutes. I yeah. know it's hard. And, and even less words, just like letting him have those few min minutes to calm down and relax. And that's when I get that full hug that I never get any other time. Yeah. But, but you're also telling me and telling the, the viewers something else. You're saying that you're getting a lot from that hug. <laughs> Probably yeah. I'm a lot less anxious too when right. I so can hug him. You're, yeah. you're having this uh, special experience of co-regulation. And in a sense, this is who we are as humans. And when your son can express that, you just feel like, oh, this is life. Because it's not like, oh, I have to prepare him, get him off to school. So he's just, he's giving something back to me. And, and you're allowing that to come in. That's important to you. And as it's important to you, it's important to him. So those are those special moments of co-regulation. And I always like to say that our role in life is to be a good enough co-regulator. And uh, because when we don't have those options, it hurts. And being a parent of a person on spectrum, there's often, in a sense, feelings of uh, emptiness because you give and you feel that the reciprocity isn't there. And I have heard parents tell me about how much they love their child, but they're not sure how much their child loves them. And this has to do with the cues that the child's giving back to them and the tone of the voice, the intonation, how the child's talking, and how it gets reflected. We can use terms like mirrored, whatever term we want to use, but it gets reflected because our body detects their behaviors. And I use the term neuroception. Our nervous system is detecting whether our child or friend or spouse is sending us cues of safety. And if the body is rigid and anxious, those aren't cues of safety. And if you right. can, in a sense, what you were doing, which is just a beautiful story, is you were allowing your ventral side to be welcoming to your sons. And it was a, a, a moment of co-regulation. And it's very fulfilling. And that's who we are as a species. And when we don't have it, then we feel that we something's missing in our life. But when we have it, it's so fluid that we only know that we don't have it when we lose it. So it's like mm -hmm. uh, we, we tend to forget about how important it, and we tend not to cherish those moments, but those moments are special. And in your situation, those are the moments that enable growth of relationship to occur. Absolutely. And you had sent me another paper that I wanted to quickly show for those watching the video. And for those not watching the video, there'll be a link to it if you go to affectautism.com. One of the things that it mentioned is in the absence of an active social engagement system, the mobilized state provides an efficient neural platform for flight, fight and flight behaviors. And I think that's really that neuroception that you were just talking about.
Yeah, well, we have to think about our body is always doing what it thinks is best for us. And the, it has to do with what is the range of behavior that comes easiest, easiest in a given physiological state. Now, for decades, the, the models for autism have been behavioral, which have placed the internet, uh, intentionality of behavior on the individual. So if you're asocial, you want to be asocial. If you're oppositional, you want to be. And if you have this intention, the only way to get out of it is to punish or to reward, to override those intention. But polyvagal theory shifts the model and says, it's not intention, it's actually what emerges from those states. What's the easiest thing that comes out? So when your body is highly mobilized in the sense of sympathetic arousal, the hypervigilance, it's very easy for the body to be defensive, to be aggressive, to be frustrated, to be angry. And of course, parents of autistic individuals know that. They know that that limit, that threshold is relatively low for the child to lose state regulation. And in a typical child, the range is much greater because the range is being regulated by a different physiological state, a calmer physiological state that involves a different uh, neural pathway from a newer mammalian vagus, but that vagus is also, uh, the regulation of that cranial nerve is in the brainstem also linked to the regulation of facial expressivity and vocal intonation, and even the capacity to extract voice from background sound. So suddenly you start realizing what are some of the other features of autistic children? Well, they have difficulty understanding what you're saying in noisy environments. And so they're treated as if their language delayed. But the, if you thought of it in a different way, the body's prepared for defense and it can't afford to listen to voice. It's listening to detect predator sounds. The other one is, you know what their voices sound like. They're not sing-songy with intonation. They tend to be more like uh, barking or yelling or, you know, they're modulating the voice with volume and not with tonal qualities. So we see this and the, the evolution of mammalian species is that vocalizations were always much more important than words. Remember, the only species with words is really, we're humans. But more important than words are the way that we say our words, the intonations, because they're conveying our physiological state. So when you have an autistic child, their voice is conveying to you their physiological state but your voice is also conveying to them your physiological state. So when you slow it up and your voice becomes more melodic, uh, more calmer, it helps to soothe and calm your child. So the issue is telling your child, calm down, does, doesn't work. Uh, I mean, it, it, that's not how our nervous system works. But if we become accessible and welcoming, then people's bodies calm down. And we have to have this, in a sense, very deep respect for the physiological state of the individual and to respect that given that state, they're e either likely to have a hair trigger to be reactive or you know, they're very resilient, have a good time. It's so essential. And I think that's the first step that I encounter on our online parent support group every week with ICDL and, and different parents that I've come across is really conveying to them when they're not yet in that state of mind how important it is for the child to feel safe and yeah. all of the things that they're doing that are making their child not feel safe which they're not even aware of yeah. and slowly like it's a it's a, a fine line to walk because all every parent is trying to do what's best for their child and you don't ever want to suggest otherwise but just bringing them around to seeing the child and, and getting that other perspective of that sense of safety, it, especially when we can't relate to it ourselves, depending yeah. on, uh, yeah. I think the, the last point is because we as a society have great difficulty relating to it. So we have arguments about law and order or safety, about more police, about metal detectors in schools or teachers carrying guns. Those are not signals to our nervous system of safety. And we have to understand signals of safety are really the melodic mother's voice calming the baby. 
uh, it's the it's the slowing up. It's saying you're comfortable, you're you're safe in my environment, and it, we have this whole notion, especially because with children, especially children with autism, everything is school structured. Uh, if you start thinking about the major intervention for autism, is really the educational system, and the educational system is one of the most threatening systems there is, because what is it? It's an evaluation system that never gives up. It's always evaluating. Whether you test or you evaluate, you're really not spending that much time saying, oh, you did a great job. That's really wonderful. Can you elaborate on, you know, in terms of journeys, they have like uh, the IEPs, you have to hit this amount of stuff. And when I was a faculty member at the University of Illinois in Chicago, I tried to revamp a curriculum for a school for autism. I actually helped design one. I did on the physical features, but I wanted to change the curriculum. I wanted to make it more uh, relate to state regulation experiences. And you, you can't budge. You can't get that within the system because they have so many hours of this, so many hours of that they have to put in. And yet, what is the real issue? As a parent of an autistic child, what is the real issue in your life? And that is, does your child regulate their physiological state in the environment in which the child is living? Or is it too challenging? And who's helping you with that? Who's teaching you? Who's providing the neural exercises that expand that range for a child? And the answer is the schools say you need more uh, math, you need more reading, you need more language skills. Well, that's fine, but you also need a better capacity to regulate your state. And everything else sits on top of that. If you can't regulate your behavior, then forget about these other aspects because cognitive development is going to suffer, language development, social development, and even self-emotional regulation will, will suffer. So let's talk now about the safe and sound protocol because you've developed uh, this, it's, it's headphones, that's a listening program. And can you describe what it is and, and how it really helps target okay. that? Okay, so, so the safe and sound protocol has two components. One is it has to be delivered in a very safe context, which means you have to be aware that you can't have distractors, you can't have low frequency sounds in the environment. Uh, so you have to have respect for the physical uh, context in which you deliver it. And the second part is the sound and the elements of the sound. And it's really a very neurophysiologically based model. It's really saying that certain frequencies of vocalizations are critical for social communication. And they only become available when we're in states that are not states of threat. So that we rather our nervous system retunes uh, when we're in states of threat, we do extraordinarily well detecting low frequency background sounds meaning predator sounds, someone walking behind us. But when we do that, we change the neural regulation of our middle ear structures, and that interferes with our ability to extract human voice. But when our body is in a safe state, then we can enhance the neural regulation of those structures to extract human voice and dampen background sounds. But functionally, if you're a scared person or a person under threat, do you want to give that up? I'm not saying on a voluntary level, your body won't allow you to. So if you're in a uh, immobilized fight flight state, you can't just say, I'm not going to listen to predator sounds. You're just going to be startled all over the place. So the safe and sound protocol uh, was really based on the premise of, could I create a stealth intervention? Could I deliver something that would trigger the nervous system into detecting cues of safety? acoustic cues of safety. And it was based on the theoretical principles that every mother and every father recognizes in their young infants. And that is if you want to calm them, you use a prosodic voice. You know the frequency band. And the safe and sound protocol was based on a feature within polyvagal theory, which identified the frequency bands for any mammalian species that would be the frequency band where the cues of safety would be delivered. It's based on the physics of these structures. So we knew what to do. And so we implemented. And then the other part was that our nervous system processes human voice differently than it does, let's say, instrumental music. So I use vocal music to leverage that. 
and we basically created neural exercises by computer altering or filtering uh, vocal music to modulate the frequency bands to create this neural exercise of extraction of the content, meaning extraction of this frequency band that really was sending, I would use this term, the distilled cues of safety and love. So if we think about it, the mother's doing that. If we think about what the father's doing with the puppy, the father's doing that. And what we're seeing is the body, had, just like the dog, if you start using this prosodic voice, the dog is like this and has no choice. The, the child has no choice. The nervous system has no choice. It relaxes to this. And in a more uh, neurophysiological sense, the listening to this modulated acoustic music changes physiological state and functionally acts like an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. So it's a calmer, it calms us down. And when our body becomes calmer, then we have the accessibility of these neural structures to extract human voice. And with that, when it works, you get a very interesting package of behaviors coming in. One is you, you do better with the extraction of human voice from background sounds. So you, your ability to, to process language becomes better. You become less reactive to low frequency sounds or background sounds. Uh, it also affects uh, visual hypersensitivities because pupillary dilation, which is really the underlying uh, neural mechanisms of light sensitivity, is regulated by a neurotransmitter that is also linked to this vagal regulation. So that disappears. You start seeing gut problems disappearing and you start seeing uh, selective eating disappearing where the children will now be exploratory and start eating more foods or different foods. So you start seeing the sensory profile, which was pretty much hammered into many of the families of autistic individuals as being a diagnostic feature, is very flexible. And if you get that physiological state shifts, you start seeing these emergent properties occurring. Now the safe and sound protocol is not a neuroplasticity. It's not based on neuroplasticity model. It's a simpler model. It says you have the structures already in your nervous system. They're just stuck in different states. It's kind of like a state, I think of a of water being steam or a fluid or ice. It's the same molecule, but it has different features. Well, our autonomic nervous system shifts into different states. And in some states, we are accessible and we can, you know, we're regulated. In other states, we're a defensive organism, a fight flight. And even in another state, we're withdrawing and shutting down. And parents of autistic individuals have uh, understood those three different states. So, you know, with a child in a sense totally detached in a shutting down or sitting in a corner versus a child who's kind of mobilized and defensive versus those wonderful moments of like that reciprocal hug. So you see them coming into your child and what the safe and sound protocol says to the body, it say, give up the defenses, become accessible. And that's what we're seeing in many of the children who do this intervention. And the intervention is in the, the strictest, uh, most efficient protocol of it with kids on spectrum is five one hour sessions. So it's not a long protocol. And what it occurs, you start hearing uh, uh, the feedback starting to occur, let's say after even day three, where the right. child's behavior becomes different. And so the protocol was really five one hour sessions. And then we would assess for these changes at one week and one month. And if the social world works with the child, uh, after the, when these features come in, it can actually be relatively permanent but with many children on spectrum, there are vulnerabilities. So if they get a fever or ill, there's a, uh, it will, it, there's a, uh, goes back to its earlier disruptive state. But then when you know that it can be recruited, so you run through another intervention. Um, you answered all of the questions I was going to ask you <laughs> about how long it is and, and what if, what if those, um, new behaviors don't last and you said you can just listen again. Yeah, yeah. now there's the, the part is that the uh, frequency of positive effects is really quite high with children on spectrum. And that has a lot to do with the fact that they come into the clinic 
when studying the clinic with their a loving caregiver and also a, an experienced provider. When we start dealing with adults, we start getting a different story because they are now on their own and vulnerability to them can create a trigger to be defensive. So if, it, if an adult comes in who has some, let's say, on-spectrum features, but also has a trauma history, cues of safety may be cues of vulnerability. And then you have to work with it with a different type of protocol, often much slower. But with younger children, uh, let's say six to uh, 14 or so, uh, the effect rate is really very good. You know, I, I would modestly say it's probably in the 80% plus. Uh, the providers who are delivering said all kids gain something. But uh, the, the point of it is, you know, we like to see these major changes in the sensory profile. And that's really what we're using. So we're using sensory profiles and, and language processing as, a, as our outcome variables. Well, um, I didn't tell you this, but my provider is sending us ours in about two weeks, and I'm really excited to use it with my son, and I can't wait to report back uh, yeah. what we see. You know, I, I look forward to hearing. Now, what's happened uh, right before the pandemic, and actually during it, uh, Integrated Listing Systems, which is now owned by a Toronto company, Unite, um, basically uh, reconfigured it to be remote. So there's a digital, it can be uh, basically a provider can assign a code for a smartphone and then you can uh, d do it at home and the provider will be able to track compliance. But uh, more than that, the provider could also do it through video conferencing. So you maintain this feedback and understanding of watching what's going on with the client. Amazing. <laughs> and I will put all of the links if people want to find out how to get access to this on the on the blog post with this podcast at affectautism.com. Um, just before we sign off, I did want to talk about that paper that I, I think mm -hmm. I prematurely shared. Mm -hmm. And this is a paper you just published about the, the polyvagal perspective on the pandemic. And I did listen to your podcast you did with Virginia Spielman, who's another floor timer. You talked a little bit about this. Did you want to share some of this with our listeners. Sure, sure. We, we have to understand that life during the pandemic is a true example of threat to us. We're all living under a chronic state of threat. And that makes our body and the way we uh, much more defense reactive, uh, much more biased to seeing negativity in the interactions that we're having. And historically, uh, humans, when they have been under threat, they've mitigated threat through social interaction. But during the pandemic, social interaction is also a threat. So we have created in our own world uh, a threat to our nervous system and taken away our go-to uh, mechanism to mitigate the threat. However, what I say in this paper is that we this pandemic is occurring in a very unique time in history, and that is it's time of the internet. So meaning that we can have a degree of social connectedness through video conferencing, through what we're doing now. And we have to learn how to use video conferencing in a different way. So historically, video conferencing has been treated like watching TV, which means that we're using it for entertainment or we're using it for educational, but not for the conveyance of our own affect to each other. And so we have, to, as we use it, we have to become more tuned to how we use it, which is, uh, even though our cameras are not in the right place, my camera's up there, so my eye contact isn't where I would like it. But I still try to, uh, as instance, look up to the camera. Uh, I wear glasses now when I do my webinars so that I can see the faces of the people I'm talking to so that I get some, I get some co-regulation out of the interaction. I'm not talking to a blank screen. So we have to, in a sense, build some neural exercises into our own life when we're doing video conferences. We need to get something back. So when I give talks, I don't want to look just at my notes. I want to look at people. Yeah, the, the bottom line, it's a paradoxical challenge, but we, we have technologies and we're smart people and we need to know that our body needs some direct interaction with others. And even if we can't have it true face-to-face, 
this is certainly a lot better than nothing. I liked how you shared with Virginia the process of just deep breathing. And I know they do that with my son at school. And sometimes the kids aren't as receptive to that. You can model it, but they may or may not do it. Um, do you have any one last tip for parents of just even the simple exercise of deep breathing with their children? Well, what I used to uh, suggest is singing is another way of getting breathing into the story or playing a wind instrument like a recorder or doing duets with that. So getting the, getting the child to exhale slowly um, is a useful way because when you exhale slowly, you're performing a very profound and powerful neurophysiological manipulation. You're basically optimizing that vagal efferent, vagal motor influence on your autonomic nervous system, you're calming yourself down. And the reflexive aspect of people taking deep breaths and gasping or uh, spending more time doing inhalation and less time doing exhalation is how we use breathing to keep us anxious or mobilized. So we have to think about uh, how we talk, the number of words we use in our phrases, uh, before we take a breath, and if we extend the duration of our phrases, we're conveying to the other compass. And I'm thinking of blowing bubbles with the kids. Yeah. And I know yeah. some kids love to blow in the straw and watch yeah. all the bubbles. And a lot of times we'll say, stop that, stop that. But in this case, maybe just, you know, make the water a third of the cup and let them blow. Yeah, no, I think that's really insightful that these you know, games are not just games, they're neural exercises of state regulation. And I think we need to be smart and realize what we're doing. Uh, you know, people think about swinging and you know, the OT type of model, that's important. Vestibular stimulation is important, but the breathing is extremely important and it is a fast path to changing physiological state. Well, thank you so much for all of this information you've given us today. Uh, Dr. Stephen Porges' website is stephenporges.com, which I'm showing here. And I will put links to everything at affectautism.com. Um, the polyvagal theory, the safe and sound protocol. I can't thank you enough for taking time during your busy schedule to share this with our listeners. And uh, hopefully, if anyone has any questions or comments, you can post to the affectautism.com blog, and you can also contact Dr. Porges through the website. Thank you, Dara. It's been a pleasure to share uh, part of the morning with you and with, with your colleagues and parents. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And it was quite a treat to mark the start of this shutdown with that keynote spe mm -hmm. speech that I saw about you, because it's, it's such an important way to stay calm and to remember, always keep rem reminding ourselves that's what's most important for our kids is to get back well, to that state. Uh, right, and I th want you, all of you, to take a very optimistic viewpoint and that is if we can get, find that portal into regulating that physiological state, many of the emergent properties that will come out will be the ones that you want, the social behavior, the interaction, the co-regulation, they will start coming out. So. That's my emphasis is that's the portal, try to get physiology regulated or calmer, meaning can the body feel safe being in itself. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, thanks again, Dr. Borges. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Until next time, here's to affecting autism through play.